Okay, so uh, we're going to move on to kinetics of uh, rigid bodies today. Uh, I can spend maybe a couple of minutes about the exam, but I'm not going to resolve the problems here because I sent you the solutions. So I know that some of you have, may have made your life a little harder than it was supposed to be. That's why I keep underlining read 10 times before you start doing anything because, yeah, the problem two and three, the combination of the two was really designed to see how much you wanted to make your life a living hell, which some of you may have done it. I had two rotations, but then really it was only one to solve problem three. And the first, the first problem, see that's what you get when you do both. Yeah, probably. I don't know. I haven't even tried. I, say, I set it to zero. I don't care about that rotation. It's not there. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't change. Anyways, so um, yeah, the first one was just theory. Same thing that we've seen with other angles three to one, just a different rotation. The second, it was just between the bar and the point. Whatever was happening around that didn't really matter. So you should have gotten something mi like minus c r dot along uh, times the direction of, of, the, uh, of, of the bar itself. The third was finding the equations of motion, simplifying that, that sketch. And the last one was, you know, the bar on top of the wheel was actually just going back and forth to the same velocity and acceleration of the point. Uh, well, velocity, not acceleration. Yeah, same velocity of the point on the wheel and the same acceleration of any point on the bar because it's just translating. But anyways, you have the solutions and uh, we're working on, you know, Correcting them, but I, I I thought the problems were reflecting what we're seeing in class more or less. So, okay, and definitely once you get your grades back, you can come see me if there's any issues. Or office hours, yes. The five points or the survey, whatever, is that five points from the exam from the overall grade? Or no, the overall grade. So if you get a hundred out of that, it doesn't make any difference for you. If you're getting fifty and fifty on your tests, then you have A. That's it. But, uh, you know, it's a five extra points that you get. If you, you, you may get 95 out of this, then you get those five extra points, and you get 100. It's just incentive so that you guys do it. I cannot do it the final one, because the final one is part of, the, yeah. of UF's procedures, but there is no midterm survey, and I really, I really like having those. To the final grade, not to each To the final. No, well, five and five will be a little too much. I will have to send you something else to do. I don't know, another survey, something. I don't know. Yeah, it's five points on the total, so. Yeah, if you have 95, you get 200. Okay. If you have 100, oh, well, I don't know. Sh we can shake hands. <laughs> okay, so kinetics of rigid, any other questions? So I'm not, I'm not seeing those. I, I talked to the TA, she's collecting your surveys. Uh, I don't care. What I will get is the same form, and she will just tell me how many people respond one, two, three in the different boxes. So you can put your cross in any of those boxes, and she will just tell me the final overall. Uh, outcome. So kinetics of rigid bodies. At this point, we are all very expert in uh, the use of tensors, right? I mean, I'm assuming that instead of thinking about the exam, you went to actually study tensors on the book. And, uh, but anyways, what, what we need about tensors is what we've seen last time in the lecture. So you have it on video and you have it on the book as well. Um, and uh, they are a pain, tensors are a pain, they're not, they're not things that we can visualize like vectors, uh, but we do need them. Uh, all you need to know is that they take a vector, they transform it into another vector in a linear way, and we have defined the product, uh, which I recall here because we're going to use it today. The circle cross or uh, tensor product between two vectors A and B is actually defined by dotting this with another vector C, and we said this is a definition so there's nothing to prove here. I, I make this up. It's B dotted with C times A, right? And that's just something we decided. It sits that way. So that's something we want to use today. Today, we're not going to do any heavy tensor type of calculations. We'll do it next time after the break. But we'll derive the general expression for the moment of inertia tensor, which we have used for, to call for years the moment of inertia matrix. That is not the right way to indicate it, as we'll see. So about rigid bodies, so far we know what? Well, we derived a couple of relationships that actually you were supposed to use in your last problem for, between two generic points on the rigid body, R, P and Q, 
we know that the difference in velocity is given by, in a, in a generic reference frame A, is given by omega of the body R in A cross with RP minus RQ, right? We derive this, and we use it today. And then something that we're not going to use today, but just to refresh our memory here. A, the same thing with the accelerations, AP in A minus AQ in A. Remember, these two points are part of the same rigid body, so there is a constant distance between the two, is alpha RA cross with RP minus RQ plus omega RA cross with omega RA cross with RP. P minus RQ. And recall that the alpha RA, the angular acceleration, is the rate of change of omega. Actually, it does not depend on, uh, on the reference frame in which you're taking the rate of change. It doesn't, doesn't matter. You always get the same vector alpha. And omega RA is a property of how the rigid body is moving. We also gave a definition of rigid body, which is the same as a reference frame. And just to refresh our memory, it's a collection of at least three non collinear points whose mutual distances don't change with time. Now, that's the definition of reference frame and rigid body. The difference is that a rigid body could have mass. And we do want the rigid bodies that we're going to talk about to have mass. Otherwise, there, there, will, be no, there will be no kinetics, of course, right? You don't really think about forces and, and, and moments and anything of that kind if you don't have any mass. So that's really the difference. Well, in general, what uh, people usually do is draw these weird shapes and say, OK, this is my rigid body R. And the general assumption is that when you talk about a rigid body, you have you know, mass all over the place. It's a continuum distrib continuous distribution of, of masses. And so for something like this, we say, OK, the total mass of the rigid body is the integral over the body of dm. And we, we are used to looking at this integral in the Riemann way with continuous functions. But what I just told you is the following, is that this object here, Three particles of different masses, or even the same masses, it doesn't matter, whose mutual distances don't change with time. Imagine they are connected magically by some massless rigid bars. This is a rigid body, too. That's the definition I gave you, right? And it is. You can actually build this. You can have three big masses and connect them with something which is almost negligible in terms of mass. As long as everything remains rigidly connected, that's a rigid body. You can throw it in the air and it will behave like a rigid body. So this would not work. If you try to do an integration over the body on, on something like this, you cannot do it with a Riemann integral. So this is not really a, an integral of this kind, like the ones that you've seen before. It's, it's what it's called a Lebesgue. You don't really need to go into many details of this. But Lebesgue integrals, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit on this, allow you to basically extend this summation of masses on the most general possible case that you can have where you may have point masses like this. You can have a combination of you know, the potato full of mass here and then one mass down here, M1, which is rigidly connected to the rest of the rigid body. You can have something like this, and you need to be able to compute the mass of that. So, the dm for a rigid body in the case of point masses will be something like this. Uh, m1, for that example, the delta function of r, the Dirac function of, delta of r1, m2, Dirac delta of r2, plus m3 Dirac delta of r3. And let me allow, allow me to call this uh, 
vectors, if you like, deltas. So I can do the D with R, just because I need to tell you that these deltas are the following. So delta of R is, I don't know if this really makes sense, the infinite vector. It's, it's, it's basically, it's concentrated only, only exists where R equal Ri, where Ri are the positions of those masses, and it's 0 where R is not equal to Ri. Why am I bothering doing this? Well, just because I want to tell you that the integral over the body of these delta functions are dr dotted with dr is equal to 1. So if I go through the uh, pain of defining mathematically all these, these quantities here, well, when you do the integral of this, then you get m1 plus m2 plus m3. Are we really going to care about this? No, not much. But you need to understand that this integration that we do over a rigid body does not have to be necessarily on continuous functions. It can be this, this integration that we are going to use from now on is going to add together all the possible masses on that body. It doesn't matter if they are point masses, if they are continuously distributed, if it's a combination of the two, you need to be able to deal with both. So that's really what would happen if you had, uh, if you had a, uh, just point masses. So this is, a, this is actually the minimum uh, rigid body, if you want, that you can define. It doesn't have to look like a triangle, but of course they need to be non-collinear. So that's really the minimum rigid body with mass for which we can talk about kinetics that we can think of. Then you can have all sorts of you know, infinite particles if you want, but it's not really necessary for you to think about a rigid body that way. OK. Any questions about this? Now for, uh, so now that we have clear in mind that this integration really extends to all sorts of possible cases, well, let's quickly define what happens with a rigid body now. We need, we need to do kinetics, so we need to be able to deal about two things at the same time, translation and rotation, right? That's what happens to a rigid body. A particle can only translate. Uh, so far, reference frames, we've seen them, uh, well, translating and rotating, but we haven't done really uh, kinetics about that. So for the translational part, well, guess what? We're going to, and we're not going to see much today, but we do what we've done last time. We define center of mass as position of the center of mass as the integral over the body of R dm over the mass of the entire rigid body. And again, this is the integral of dm over the entire body. I don't want to write it several times. And then we define the velocity of the center of mass with respect to some reference frame. Let's, uh, let's stick with the inertial one, since we, we're doing kinetics here. So we definitely are going to work in inertial reference frames. Uh, integral over the body of v n dm over the mass, and finally the acceleration of this point center of mass in n is going to be the integral of the acceleration of all the points dm over the mass. Bless you. In these integrals, keep in mind what's happening here is this is the position vector that sweeps from the origin you picked of your coordinate system to all the points on the rigid body. And these are the velocities of all the points of the rigid bodies. These are the accelerations of all the points. So this is center of mass, right? And that, that allows us to deal with the translation. We derived a, an expression for systems of particles, and it will be pretty much the same for a rigid body. When it's continuum, it's the same. And so that's how we deal about the translational part. You can think about this virtual point. Uh, that may be on the body or not. Again, if it's a donut or something like that, the center of mass is not even on the body, and it doesn't have any mass. Uh, but it's a, a point we define this way, and we find that f equal ma can be written for that point if we imagine uh, f being all the external forces, m, the total mass of the rigid body of system of particles, acceleration is the acceleration of the center of mass. That is not Newton's second law. It is derived from that law. Uh, and, uh, and the third one, but that's how we 
deal with the translation. Now, how do we deal with the rotation of a rigid body? What do you think is the vector that represents rotation? That's what we've done from day one almost. We computed what? For reference frames. Yeah. So this is, this is what we're going to care about for uh, rotation. OK? Now, the point is here we're going to do kinetics. So we want to see how actions from outside the rigid body change the vector, how they affect the vector. And we're, gonna, we're not going to find the expression today, but we'll get there. Um, if you think about any body that can be a rigid body, uh, of course, you know that if, if this is the rigid body and I am starting with a zero angular velocity with respect to the reference frame, which is this room, it's easier for me. I, my effort is less if I want to generate a rotation about this axis than a rotation about this other axis, right? That's pretty intuitive. And maybe you don't feel it much with a, an eraser, but with bigger bodies, you can. And why is that? Moment of inertia, tensor, it's mass. For now, since we're going to define it, I would say it's the mass distribution that, that, that it's really uh, the issue here. So if, again, if I do it with the table, and if I try what I'm, and this is starting a rest, and I start rotating about this axis, I'm basically, that's the way I envision it at least, I'm going to change the velocity of all these points uh, with respect to the central axis about which I'm trying to rotate. And so I have to, the delta velocities that I have to impose is, is less overall distributed on the body. If I try to do it about this axis here in the middle, well, the, the points are much farther away from the axis, so the velocities uh, will be higher if you try to rotate the same, the same angle. So masses that are far away from the rotations, uh, rotation axis um, will, uh, will affect you in, the, in, in, in terms of the effort you need to put into changing the uh, orientation of the body, right? And then masses may not be uniformly distributed. That's another story. You can have more mass towards the uh, ends of the table. If I start charging here with, you know, piece of metal, I don't know, add, add masses at the end, it, may, it will make it harder than if I put it just at the center and I do try to do the same rotation. So the mass distribution is really the key in, 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 the, in the way we can affect uh, the changes of that vector. And so before we get there, we need to define um, a few things. And uh, actually, these are things that we have already defined. We're just going to extend to a rigid body. Let's see what I need here. This, I'm going to need it. Wow, I'm going to erase it, actually. So we define angular momentum for a rigid body. That's really what we're going to do. As we have done last time, let Q be a generic point in 3D Euclidean space and N an inertia reference frame then we say we have a rigid body R R is a rigid body and so we define the angular momentum of uh, in of, of the rigid body R in N with respect to point Q so if you want, this is a definition. Well, what do you think this is going to be? We defined angular momentum already a couple of times for a particle, then for a system of particles. Now, this is generalizing to a rigid body. So when we generalize, it means that we talk about integrals here. This is going to be the integral over the body of R minus R of Q cross with the velocity in the inertia reference frame of any point. Uh, remember, this is an integral. So these are sweeping. This is sweeping to all the points on the body. This is the velocity of all the points on the body as you do your integration, minus vq in n dm. 
Okay, Let's see if I use it. I use Q or something else. Yeah, we use Q. Always Q. Nothing special here. But we can do something about this. We can. So I told you Q is any point. How about since that's really what you do in kinetics of rigid bodies, we start picking points on the body. on R, and we call it, let's just change the name, call it B, since it's part of the body, I don't know. We call it B now. So it's the same expression, but HB in N is the integral over the body of R minus RB, cross with uh, velocity in N minus velocity of B in N, dM. What do I know now? I know something more, something, something else with respect to that expression. That, that point Q was any point. Why did I put a point here just to save one letter? I don't know. Um, we know the relationship between B and any other point in the body. We know this, right? What is this? You guys tell me. You know pretty well at this point. Omega R in N. Omega R in N cross with R minus RB. So let's, uh, let's substitute it in there. Um, let's see. I'm going to call these, not this. It's the other one. I'm going to call this R minus RB. Let's just call it the vector rho. Now this R minus RB is nothing else than a vector that from B is sweeping to all points on the rigid body, right? And B is fixed. A point, you know, I should probably add it here. Fixed on R, in R. So it's a point on the body. So if I do that, I call that R, I get integral over the body of R cross with omega R n cross with rho, dm. And that's why I need to copy from my notes here, because I refuse to memorize certain formulas. OK, what's that uh, ugly the triple product there? That's a triple product. That's a triple cross product, right? And I don't remember the expression. So I'll just, I'll just give it to you. When you have A, B, and C, and you do the triple cross product, you get the following. It's A dotted with C, B minus A dotted with B, C. Save brain cells. I don't. I don't. I don't want to memorize this. If I try to remember this, I will always get something wrong. Either the sign or the order of these. It's okay. Okay. So now, if I use this there, so my a is rho, my c is also rho, and omega is b. What do I get? What do I get? You want to do it? Rho dotted with rho, omega r n, make sense? Minus, second term is a dotted with b times c, a dotted with b is what? There's no zeros here. Why? OK. Times rho. dm. Now, I told you we were going to get to these eventually. That last term reminds me of something, which is this tensor product, which was defined as B 
started with CA. This is a little easier to remember than that one. But because if I look at uh, rho dotted with omega rho, I can rewrite it using this. So rho dotted with omega r n times rho. If I use this expression here, so I go from here to here, what do I what do I what do I get? Bless you. What do I get? Circle cross. This is a tensor product. We're going to actually do calculations about what we get today next time. So don't think about what this is really for now. Just apply the definition of tensor product. What if if so if this is my B and this is my A and this is my C, I, I, I look at these the following way. It's rho, circle cross rho dotted with omega R N. I can do that, right? That's the definition. I define that that tensor product there. So that's the second term. For the first one, uh, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to define the unit tensor. Oh, I'm sorry. I want to call it unit identity tensor. That's the right word. Such that if you uh, if you apply this tensor u, you do the dot product of of that with b, you get b itself. And so the second one, rho uh, dotted with rho omega r n, I can write it as rho dotted with rho u omega r n, right? No? You like it? Which right here? Below. No, 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 no. Third, third line. Yeah, right there. So you're right using a vector on this side, on the left hand side. Okay, this is, okay. That's a vector. This is a vector. This is a scalar multiplying a vector. This is a right tensor right. applied on a vector, so that's another vector. Is that a dot then, or is that something else? Because if it's a dot, and you got two vectors, you get a scalar. Well, you don't, we said, we said, no, no, these are not two vectors. This is a tensor. This is a tensor. Right? Gives you, gives you. It's applied. Remember, we well. You, we do. We, this is operated on, but I don't have another. Okay. I don't have another symbol that I want to make up to distinguish it. But it should be whatever this does to this vector will be another vector. So this this tensor that for now we don't know what it is. Rho circle cross with rho could be just something that takes omega and then changes its orientation. Whatever, it's, it's a linear operator that will return me another vector. So, yeah. It's, it's pretty much when you see the dot product between two vectors, you know it's a dot, pro it's the inner product. When you see the dot product between a tensor and a vector, it means that you're operating. So I'm using the same symbol, but it should be, uh, the difference is that when you, when you do the dot between two vectors, you get a scalar. When you do the dot between a tensor and a vector, you get a vector. Okay, so that's just uh, substituting things so that I get the following in this integral here. I get, so I'm going from down there to up here. I get the integral of, uh, so let me substitute that first. Rho dotted with rho, u uh, omega r n. And that's the first one. Then what do I have here? I have minus uh, the tensor product rho with itself, omega r n. And this is all integrated over the body dm, right? What do you notice there? 
there's something I can do to make this look a little nicer than that. Omega, right, omega Rn is a property of the rigid frame, which in this case is a rigid, uh, the reference frame, which is in this case a rigid body. And it doesn't really depend on the integration. It's a vector that tells you how the entire body is changing orientation at a given time. So I can rewrite this as the integral of all this ugliness here, rho dotted with rho u omega Rn minus rho simple cross, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I was taking it out and it's still there. Uh, rho simple cross uh, rho, that's it, dm. So this whole thing, if you want, just to underline that this is isolated from omega, it's applied on omega. Now this is a vector, and remember this is giving me <coughs> h, uh, what did I call it, b? Point B, right, in N. B is a body fixed point. Remember, I cannot do this if it's not a fi uh, body fixed point. I started by saying that there was a relationship between the velocities of any point on the body and B. If this wasn't the case, I couldn't even get to this expression. So this is a vector here, HB. This is a vector omega. What is this? This is my moment of inertia tensor. There is no inertia matrix. There is a tensor which represents the mass distribution of the body. We're going to go into the details of this next time. Uh, I may even finish a few minutes early today, you know, before spring break, I don't know. But, um, so I'm not going to expand this for this particular case we'll see next time. But this is a coordinate free expression that it's telling me, okay, if I want the angular momentum of the rigid body that I'm looking at with respect to a body fixed point, well, that angular momentum will be given by the moment of inertia tensor, which is calculated with respect to B. Of course, there is B here somewhere because these raw vectors are going from B to all the points on the body. Uh, which is a tensor applied on the angular velocity vector. So as you change B, the point on the body with respect to which you want to compute the angular momentum, you're going to change the tensor, right? Which remains a coordinate free uh, quantity. It doesn't, I haven't talked about reference frames here. I haven't talked about, well, reference frame, the only thing is the inertial and R, but uh, I really haven't mentioned any coordinate systems. I haven't projected any vectors. I haven't expressed anything in a particular coordinate system here. It's all uh, coordinate free. So that is already, and of course, at some point, we're going to take the time derivative of that, as you can imagine, not today. But that is already giving me some information about how the mass distribution of the body affects h in this case. And we'll see that taking the rate of change of h is going to be useful to, to do kinetics. But uh, at this point, I have the following expression. I have h b in n is equal to some tensor that, of course, is going to call i. That's the letter we use. i, let's see, with respect to b of the body r operated on this angular velocity here. That's pretty much what we have to derive today. Again, this is a tensor. This is some linear operator uh, that, in this case, we will obtain uh, as a function of how the shape of the body and the mass distribution of the body. And, and at some point, we'll pick a coordinate system that operates on the angular velocity and gives you the uh, h and b. Uh, another step that you can take is choosing the center of mass now. So you do h bar, and well, you just have to compute the, mom the moment of inertia tensor with respect to the center of mass. So b is now the center of mass, but this doesn't change at all. It's another body fixed point. OK? So all this doesn't have anything to, to do with coordinate systems up until now, at least.
what we start doing is at some point we'll pick we have already picked points that are on the body we're going to choose probably a coordinate system which is also fixed with the body to express all these these quantities and the beauty will be that this tensor here it doesn't matter if you do it with respect to central mass or any other body fixed point is going to be a constant tensor that's the beauty of doing it with respect to a coordinate system projecting these expressing these in a coordinate system which is fixed with the with the body itself that's exactly what you've been you know doing for a long time but we've been calling we've been calling this probably the matrix of inertia well that becomes a matrix once you pick a coordinate system and once you pick a coordinate system you're stuck with that you have to use it but i haven't decided anything here yet it will be convenient to use a body fixed you know, coordinate system because this will become constant and uh, so we'll we'll express this i a little better next time it will be a little you know calculation intensive but we'll do it just once with respect to the central mass in a body fixed coordinate system we'll see that you basically have to do it just once and you will get this matrix of inertia that we've been talking about for years and years with this i11 i22 i33 and all the other uh, off diagonal terms i12 etc 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 so you do this once and there are tables on books that give you all these and these are unfortunately called moments of inertia just to make your life a little more complicated so the same expression is reused so that's the moment of inertia tensor once you project into a coordinate system you get these numbers that are moments of inertia on the diagonal and and products of inertia off diagonal but again, the beauty is that you'll you, you know for certain shapes what those are. There are formulas given to you on, on, on tables. You do a lookup table, you get them, and that's the end of the story. Next time we'll derive the expression for those, the general expressions. And we'll also comment on another uh, used and abused uh, theorem, I think it's called the, the parallel axis theorem, which allows you to transport these, moment, these moments of inertia to another axis. We'll derive it and we'll also show that it's not really needed. So you really can just, when you deal with a rigid body, you can really just focus on the tensor of inertia expressed with respect to the central mass expressed in one coordinate system. Once you have that, there are expressions, easy expressions that allow you to translate to any other points on the body. You don't have to do the even the parallel axis theorem, but we'll see all that because we are doing it with tensors, because we are doing it this way, not just assuming that we are already in some coordinate system. I think I don't want to push on this more than this today. I just wanted to find H. Um, do you have any questions, any issues? Well, we have uh, 10 minutes. Maybe we can talk about the exam after all, if you want. No? You don't have any questions about the solutions? Anything that was not clear in the solutions? So problem one, there's nothing, nothing really that we need to say, right? One, two, one rotation. Uh, you follow the same procedure we've seen in lecture nine, I believe. But one, two, one, what comes down to be is, well, is this is axis one, this is two and three. You do your first rotation about this axis, call it theta 1. This 2 goes into a new axis, 2 prime, call it 2 prime. I'm not even respecting the, you know, the nomenclature I've used the last time. But then the fact that the second rotation is 0 degrees here means that your new 1 axis is your old 1 axis. So you're going to do the last rotation here. So this is theta 2 about the same axis and as we said last time you can have infinite combinations that will lead you to the same final orientation so that's not, that's not a good uh, a good thing to do to do a one two one sequence so this was a one two one sequence with the second angle that goes to zero and that's the geometrical explanation that you uh, were asked to give me uh, you go this way or you go this way well i mean again if theta one is ten and theta three is minus ten 
or you know, I, I don't know, I write, well, minus minus five, whatever. You can have, you can also have fifteen and and minus ten, and you will still do the same. You know, you can have infinite combinations of these two that will give you the final result in terms of the orientation of the body, and so that that's not a good choice. Uh, it's a singular case, and uh, the mathematical expression, I didn't give you the result because I don't think the I don't think you really need it. I mean, you, you went through your calculations. The bottom line is you should have seen at some point some sine of theta 2 that goes at the denominator if you try to invert the matrix that you have that relates the angular rates, um, theta 1 dot, 2 and 3, with the omega components. So this was the determinant of the matrix that comes down to being sine of theta 2 or something like that. So this goes to 0, and that's, that's the mathematical reason that you have a 0 at the denominator. Yeah, the matrix you get is 1, 0, 1, 0, cosine of a third angle, 0, 0, negative sine of a third angle, 0. So when you take the determinant, it's 0. Yep. At, at theta 2 equals 0. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that was really just you know refreshing theory. It was nothing, you know, nothing really special on that one. The second, um, it was really to see if you could apply the definition. I think probably most of you have got it right. Apply the definition of uh, relative velocity. That's, that's all I wanted. So there was this guide, which is also ends up being an inertial uh, reference frame. And then there was this bar with the center that can go on the guide. Uh, this position of this center is given by this angle theta, and the position of this bar is given by this other angle phi. And then there's a point mass here that moves with uh, coefficient of friction c. So this was viscous friction. And so all you need to tell me is the force of friction. And so long story short is if this is bar b and this is point p, well, the force of friction is minus C V rel, right? So all you needed to do was computing, finding V rel. And V rel, in general, is independent from reference frame, is the velocity of your mass in a certain reference frame, doesn't matter what that is, minus the velocity of the point of contact as seen being part of the surface on which the mass is moving in the same reference frame. Well, but what we've done, yeah, what we've done several times is I pick B. This was called B, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what you had. How about I pick that point? Velocity of the mass in B minus velocity of the point of contact part of B in B. And as I said, it's all the story here, this is zero. And uh, so if I sit myself, if I put myself here, this is me looking at that particle moving, all I see is that distance was R, basically. R yeah, it's R dot whatever you one unit vector you want to define along the, uh, the bar itself. So to be thorough here, you define your reference frames. One of them is the bar, because that's a perfectly legit reference frame. And you attach a coordinate system with that bar. The origin is the center of the bar. The position was r here, right? And so that's your relative velocity. So minus c r dot u1 was really all I wanted to see. And I did it on purpose to give you all these crazy rotations. I, I, I actually thought at some point I, I should add a third one about the vertical axis just to make it more fun. And it will still, you will still get the same thing because it's between the bar and the point. And then I did think about giving you to compute the, the equations of motion of this, just as it is. Uh, this is inertial. Go in and compute the, the equations of motion. But I'll be honest with you. I started doing the calculations, and I said, this is crazy. It is crazy. I said, no. I mean, I'm not going to make their life so miserable because I don't want to. I just want to see if they understand the concepts. So I, I, I decide, OK, let's simplify this. And one way is just lock that thing in place. So the, 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 sec the following problem was the same, where now g is given as inertial. And so you need to find acceleration of that point with respect to g if you want to use f equal ma. Now this bar is always at this orientation. So it doesn't matter where you are. It's not changing orientation. So it's not rotating with respect to g. It doesn't have any angular velocity with respect to g, right? You can think about this as uh, maybe Earth, satellite. Satellite is going around. If nothing changes, if there's no torques, 
on the satellite is really maintaining its orientation, right? That's an inertially fixed uh, attitude satellite. Maybe it's pointing at some star that is far away, but anyways. And so, yeah, you really didn't have to do much there. You had to find the, uh, this is P. The uh, position of P was given as in G with respect to the, the point O. So I'm, I'm really going too quick here. I'm skipping all you know, setting reference frames and origins, et cetera. So G is one of the reference frames, the ground. Uh, and then I have this vector that goes to, what was this point? I don't know. Q. Q, yeah. That's yeah. RQ. So that's RQ. And uh, yeah. So basically R of P is RQ plus R of P with respect to Q. My second reference frame is the one that contains O and Q and rotates with an angle theta. So it's perpendicular if you want to the board and goes around with O and Q. And so if you, if you do V of P, that's um, DRQ DT, of course this is in G, G plus DRP with respect to Q DT in G. And I know that when things are too simple, people don't believe it. But it is simple. It is simple. This needs the transport theorem. Because if I sit myself in the reference frame that is with that vector or Q, then you can do d r q d t in, uh, say that that's A, plus omega A G cross with r q itself. This one, this is already r e x, assuming that I have defined the ground co fixed coordinate system like this, right? I think I did it this way, I don't remember. So if you forget about z, so that's, that's, that's no brain. I mean, the second one is just already r, one, r dot ex. It's already expressed in a, so you keep going, you find the acceleration, f equal ma, the only forces you have are your force of friction and some reaction from the, uh, from the bar, that's it. And then the last one, I'm not saying that they're simple. I'm just saying that if you don't have the concepts right in your mind, they, they may look more complicated than actually are. That's, that's all. I'm not, I'm not trying to oversimplify things here. But So this was the last one, right? Ground, the, the wheel. It's rolling on the ground, and then magically here there is a bar that can only, for some reason, translate horizontally. And so I'm telling you there is a roll here, and there is all up here. So the velocity, if this is the wheel, and this is point, I don't know, P here and Q up here. The velocity of point P as part of the wheel seen by the ground is 0, because the velocity of the same point as part of the ground seen by the ground is 0. And so from these, you build your velocity of q, your acceleration of q. And since that bar can only go back and forth, whatever is the velocity of the point q that is part of the bar here will be the velocity of this point that is somewhere else on the bar. It's actually the velocity of all points on the bar, because it can only translate. And since that ends up being expressed easily in the ground fixed coordinate system, once you have the velocity, you take your rate of change, and you're done with the acceleration too. OK? So we're correcting these. I, I hope uh, get them back to you when we come back from the break. And uh, if there are any issues, of course, you come to my office hours, and we'll, we'll talk about them. Have a good break. <laughs>